once around asteroid Apophis, at one stage believed to be one of the greatest threats in terms of an asteroid impact of a fairly significant body on the Earth. So these asteroids are small space rocks left over from the early days of the building of the solar system. They live mostly between Mars and Jupiter. So Mars orbits at 1.6 AU, an astronomical unit, the Earth-Sun distance. So the Earth is 150 million kilometers from the Sun, Mars 1.6 times greater, all the way out to Jupiter at five astronomical units. And the main body of the asteroid belt is at 2.8 AU. But there are many objects that have been scattered away from those more regularized orbits into highly elliptical paths that perhaps go out into the asteroid belt region and then dive back in towards the inner part of the solar system. And some of them are NEOs, near-Earth objects that come close to the Earth, some even potentially hazardous objects, PHOs. These are obviously of interest from the point of view of risk of impact, but also often for the chemistry that they reveal about the early stages of the formation of the solar system. These objects have never been subject to alteration and uh, contain the seeds and the chemistry, perhaps even of life. So these near-Earth objects, you can further subdivide them into four groups. The amors that orbit exterior to the Earth's orbit, but within the orbit of Mars, so never making it all the way out to the asteroid belt. These have been perhaps deflected and captured into even shorter orbits. Shorter still, the Apollos, which cross from outside the Earth's orbit to just within it, the Atens, whose semi-major axis, the long axis of their elliptical orbit, is actually shorter than that of the Earth, but nevertheless, they just intersect with its trajectory around the Sun. And the Atiras that are entirely within the Earth's orbit, so even tighter in towards the Sun, but still come relatively close to us. And obviously, it's the uh, risk of collision, mostly from the Apollos and the Atens. So Apophis is an Aten, semi-major axis slightly less than that of the Earth, dives into 0.74 astronomical units, pretty close to Venus, and out to 1.1, just beyond that of the Earth, crossing our path twice in its orbit around the Sun. So in 2004, it was realized that it was coming our way and that in 2029, just a few years from now, we'll pass close to the Earth. When I say close, just 30,000 kilometers. So that's actually going to make it extremely easy to see it whizzing across the sky and bring it inside the orbit of some of our satellites. The Clark Belt, where the geostationary satellites orbit around the Earth, taking exactly 24 hours to complete one lap, and so staying directly above a single point on the Earth's surface, orbit around at about this distance. And so we've got this little animation here of Apophis coming in and passing by the Clark Belt, uh, potentially disturbing some of the asteroids, uh, some of the satellites, rather, and uh, going on its way. Now, when it passes by the Earth, the Earth's gravity will deflect its path. This would be putting it onto a new orbit, and you can see that in the graphic to the right there. The trajectory is changed but it's also in the graph at the top there, shows the perturbation from the old orbit in red to the new orbit in green, with the orbit of the Earth being shown in yellow. And there is some doubt as to exactly how much that will be. It's a very, very sensitive process. When you come that close to a larger planet, you will get a kick, but the exact path just depends on the absolute details of what's going to happen. And what scientists were able to calculate was that this 2029 close approach would potentially 
take it through what's called a gravitational keyhole that would bring it even closer in 2036. In fact, bringing it to impact the Earth on Easter Sunday, the A April the 13th, somewhere along the dotted red line that's the uh, path across the Earth where that impact was expected. And again, not possible to be any more precise than somewhere along that line. But that was a pretty scary idea. It set the record for the highest impact probability, level four on what's called the Torino scale, which is one of those logarithmic scales. So if it's below zero, it's pretty unlikely, but at each step up, it's 10 times more likely to create an impact. So this was uh, well up there with a very high risk factor. So what's a POFIS like? Well, it's 450 meters along its long axis. The bottom diagram there shows a radar interpretation of the shape, showing it to be longer and thinner. It's, uh, I guess, what we would call a potato-shaped asteroid, not large enough to have had its gravity overcome the strength of the material and pull itself into an efficient sphere or close to it, but uh, quite elongated. And the estimates of its mass come out at 60 million tonnes. That's a lot of material. And moving at orbital speed, coming to Earth with a thump, that would be a tremendous impact if it did occur. The calculations suggest it would be a thousand megatons equivalent TNT explosion. Now, the uh, most uh, powerful atomic bomb, the Tsar Bomba, detonated over the Arctic by the Soviet Union back in the day was around 50 million tons. So this would be massively greater than that. It would be a hundred times the power of the 1908 Tunguska effect that uh, blew up over Siberia and leveled trees for hundreds of miles in every direction. So this would be big, but it's still small in comparison to the Chicxulub impact, uh, 100,000 times less energy released than the one that took out the dinosaurs 66 million years ago. So an intermediate, but nevertheless quite devastating uh, impact for anyone that happened to be anywhere near it. Um, it would make a mess of an entire continent. But tracking the object very, very closely and watching its orbit, we've been able to refine the estimates. So in fact, it will not pass through that gravitational keyhole that would bring it to Earth in 2036. And the Goldstone radar images were able to pin that down initially to give it a less than a one in a million and then subsequently a one in a billion chance of coming our way close enough to impact us. And there are several other potential impact dates in the 2050, 2060, 2070 range of dates where it will come close to the Earth. But on no occasion in the next 100 years will it come closer than uh, the planet Venus does to the Earth already? So these are nowhere near as close as we had feared, or even as close as the 2029 impact. But eventually, it probably will find its way into an impact. And that might be with the Earth, or it could be with Venus itself. In the long run, it's impossible to entirely predict the orbit of any of the objects in the solar system and particularly so with smaller ones. The smaller an object is, the more the orbit can get deflected by non-gravitational effects and the main one is called the Yarkovsky effect. What happens is that when you have an asteroid that is rotating, the sunward side gets heated then the asteroid rotates so that the warm side is now pointing away from the sun and is able to cool by infrared radiation. So what happens is that the asteroid stops the incoming solar radiation on one side 
and the solar radiation carries momentum, so it's giving the object a push on that side away from the sun. And then as the asteroid rotates, the energy is re-radiated away from it in a different direction, leading to that momentum leaving, giving a different momentum vector, and it pushes the object in two different directions, one from the initial push of the sun and one as the reaction to the leaving infrared radiation. And so the overall net vector is neither aligned with the sun nor at right angles to it. And uh, the thrust produced can be really quite hard to predict, especially if the asteroid is irregular in shape and spinning and tumbling. This can mean that the uh, drift direction is very, very hard to get a handle on. And so the effect is that the orbit gradually changes due to this. And of course, as the asteroid's orbit changes, the effect changes. So the drift is itself unpredictable. So it's quite difficult to work out where these guys are going to go, even if you have all the best measurements in the world. Now, the interest in Apophis um, continues, but the story initially flips to a different asteroid called Bennu, discovered in 1999. It was decided that a spacecraft, a Cyrus-Rex, would fly to Bennu and pick up some samples and return them to the Earth. And it did so very successfully. There was initially a problem with the uh, container door for the sample, but they, NASA got over that and were able to fill the canister with more material than they were expecting, bring it back and drop the canister back at the Earth uh, in September of 2023. And the analysis has proved very, very interesting because Bennu is a very small space rock and is one of those objects that appears to contain a lot of the material from the dawn of the solar system. There was more water than we were expecting. It appears that many of the minerals were formed in liquid water. Um, and so it looks like Bennu was split away from a larger body. And the most recent results show interesting chemistry, including things like the nucleotide bases, the A, T, C, G, and even the U from DNA and RNA seeming to be present in some of the chemical soup that was discovered lurking on Bennu. But the point really is that after the canister was dropped back to Earth in 2023, the spacecraft itself was free to continue on its mission and fly away from the Earth again to rendezvous with another object. And the object in question was Apophis. So OSIRIS-REx, the asteroid sample regolith explorer, which is where the acronym seems to come from, was re renamed Apophis Explorer or Apex. And Osiris Apex is due to visit Apophis and arrive in 2029, just in time for that close approach to the Earth. That kind of makes sense. You might as well wait for the asteroid to come to you. And when it does so, it's going to touch down on the surface and fire its rocket engines in order to blast some material off the surface, which it can then study. And that will reveal further interesting data about the origin and nature of Apophis. But it will also see if the resulting kickback on Apophis will deflect it at all. Um, and that's interesting from the point of view of being able to try deflecting this object should we ever need to do so. And obviously, uh, this was considered very, very important until that Goldstone radar result showed that we're safe for at least 100 years. But 100 years in astronomy, not very long. All of the interest led to several other missions to Apophis. European Space Agency proposed in 2005 a mission called Don Quixote, to go and meet up with Apophis and study it. 
Uh, that did not get the go-ahead in the end, but was superseded by another ESA mission, RAMSIS, the Rapid Apophis Mission for Security and Safety. And the clue is in the name there, Rapid. So this was for very rapid response to the potential threat. And the idea is to launch this in 2028, and it still seems to be going ahead um, with all dispatch, and to meet up with Apophis in February of 2029. And the main spacecraft is going to go and rendezvous with the asteroid and take a couple of those little tiny CubeSat, uh, um, six-inch by six-inch satellites, uh, that with it that it will deploy, and these will orbit around the uh, asteroid and make measurements. And they're also going to see if they can uh, affect its orbit with the main spacecraft by just being there and the very, very slight gravitational tug that the uh, uh, effect of the mass of the spacecraft has is going to be interpreted and measured as yet another way of potentially deflecting these sorts of objects in the future. And China got in on the act with Tianwen-2. This was supposed to launch in 2022, but didn't, and it was moved to 2025 with different goals now. So they abandoned the idea of going to Apophis. They're going to visit some other asteroids and investigate those instead. And you may recall the DART mission. The DART mission was sent to a dual asteroid, uh, the main asteroid Didymus and its little moon Dimorphos in orbit round each other. And the uh, idea was to actually deflect an asteroid. They chose to deflect Dimorphos, the smaller uh, satellite object, from one captured orbit of its parent to a different captured orbit of its parent. I suspect that meant it was safe if you just nudge the little uh, orbiting guy. The main body is going to carry on almost unaffected on its trajectory, and there was no danger of accidentally sending this thing our way. So the DART mission was able to ram into and give a kick to Dimorphos, and the impact shifted its orbit, and it was more successful than it was expected to be. It was over double the kick, it seemed to adjust Dimorphos's orbit by more than double the factor that we uh, expected. So that was good news in that uh, the asteroid responded better to the transfer of momentum from the impactor than we were expecting. Um, and so this is a good dress rehearsal for when we actually need it. And one day we will, because on the average, once every 80,000 years, a large object will arrive and collide with the Earth. The Earth has many craters on it, and we've been discovering more and more and recognizing them for what they are in recent years using things like uh, Google Maps and Google Earth and all sorts of other uh, curious methods for spotting these previously unidentified craters. And uh, obviously, a lot of the craters we can't find because the space rocks land in the water and the ocean floor doesn't uh, bode well for discovery of craters. It gets silted up and indeed on, in the long run gets subducted down below the continents by the process of plate tectonics and the evidence is rubbed out. So it's really only the land where you find craters. And talking of which, this is Meteor Crater in Arizona where a large space rock came down and hit the ground and just missed the visitor's center, as you can see at the top there. Except I'm kidding, because, of course, this came down 50,000 years ago. Um, so we're getting round to being due for another walloping great impact on that 80,000-year average timescale. Of course, it could be much longer than that, or it could be next week. We just don't know. So thanks very much for listening to this short video about Apophis, one of the most dangerous objects known to man, um, but we're safe from it for at least 100 years. Thanks very much.